السلام علیکم پچھلے چند لیکچر سے ہم سافٹ ویئر کنفیگوریشن مینجمنٹ کے اوپر بات کر رہے ہیں سافٹ ویئر کنفیگوریشن مینجمنٹ سسٹم اسٹیبلشز اینڈ مینٹینز دی انٹیگریٹی آف سافٹ ویئر آرٹیفیکٹس اینڈ دیئر کنفیگوریشنس تھرو آؤٹ دا سافٹ ویئر ڈیولپمنٹ لائف سائیکل کنفیگوریشن مینجمنٹ سسٹم انکلوڈس سیٹ آف پالیسیز پریکٹسز procedures and tools that help an organization maintain its software. So, the configuration management is or software configuration management. है. It consists of many things. It consists of policies, as I have told you, practices, है, procedures, है, or tools. Today, we will talk about software configuration management ki practices. Ki baat ایک پروسیجر بھی ہم ڈسکس کریں گے اور پھر ہم دیکھیں گے کہ مختلف ڈومین اپلیکیشن ڈومینس میں یا مختلف انڈسٹریز میں چینج کنٹرول پریکٹسز کیا ہیں اینڈ وچ پریکٹسز آر بیٹر دین ادرس سو لیٹ اس اسٹارٹ آور ڈسکشن آن بیسٹ پریکٹسز فار سافٹ ویئر کنفیگوریشن مینجمنٹ جیسا کہ میں نے کہا تھا کہ سافٹ ویئر کنفیگوریشن مینجمنٹ جو ہے وہ بہت سارے ایکٹیویٹیز کا نام ہے اس کے ایس سی ایم کے بہت سارے فنکشنز ہیں تو سب سے پہلے جو پریکٹسز ہم کنسیڈر کریں گے وہ ہوں گی پریکٹسز فار مینجنگ ورژنز آف سافٹ ویئر آرٹیفیکٹس تو ایک سافٹ ویئر آرٹیفیکٹ کے مختلف ورژنز جو ہیں ان کو مینج کرنے کے لیے کون سی بیسٹ پریکٹسز ہیں جو کہ ایک آرگنائزیشن کو ایک سافٹ ویئر ڈیولپمنٹ کمپنی کو یا ایک سافٹ ویئر ڈیولپمنٹ ٹیم کو یوٹیلائز کرنی چاہیے اڈاپٹ کرنی چاہیے تو سب سے پہلے ہے کہ آل سورس آرٹیفیکٹس شوڈ بی انڈر کنفیگوریشن کنٹرول اٹ از این آبویس پریکٹس بٹ گیٹ اٹس ویری امپورٹنٹ اینڈ از اے ویری پاورفل What this means is that any software code that is independent should be placed under configuration control. Uske jo bhi versions bante hain, aap usko bakaida version management karein through configuration management system. Ye na ho ki aapke baaz jo software ke pieces hain, ye parts hain, وہ تو کنفیگوریشن مینجمنٹ کے اندر ہوں بعض نہ ہوں آل سورس آرٹیفیکٹس شوڈ بی پارٹ آف دی کنفیگوریشن کنٹرول میکنزم دوسری جو پریکٹس ہے وہ یہ ہے کہ آل آرٹیفیکٹس یوز ٹو پروڈیوس این آرٹیفیکٹ آف اے ڈیلیوری شوڈ بی انڈر کنفیگوریشن کنٹرول یہ اس سے نیکسٹ اسٹیپ ہے وہ یہ ہے کہ ایسے سورس کوڈس ایسے آرٹیفیکٹس جو ہم یوز کرتے ہیں ٹو جنریٹ اے ڈیلیوری پیکیج فار دا کسٹمر وہ سارا سافٹ ویئر بھی کنفیگوریشن کنٹرول میں ہونا چاہیے دس ول ہیلپ اس ان ڈٹرمیننگ کہ ایٹ گیون ٹائم کسٹمر کے پاس کون سی ریلیز ہے کون سا ورژن ہے سافٹ ویئر کا اور وی کین ہیو این ایگزیکٹ کاپی that a customer has. This is particularly important if you have many versions of a product and you have many customers who are using varying aspects of your software product. And so each customer may have a different version of the software product. So for any software package that is delivered to the customer, the software that is used to, to generate that package should also be under configuration control. The three best practice to have will have to work within managed private workspaces. Now this looks very obvious, that every programmer 
उसकी अपनी एक प्राइवेट वर्क स्पेस होती है यूजली मैनेज बाय दैट इंडिविजुअल हिमसेल्फ और हर सेल्फ बट समाइम्स इट हैपन्स दैट द प्रोग्राम इज आर नॉट केयरफुल एंड दे मिक्स डिफरेंट वर्जन इन द सेम वर्क स्पेस एंड एज अ रिजल्ट दे हैव टू फेस मैनी प्रॉब्लम्स सो यू शुड ऑलवेज वर्क एज एज ए डिवेलपर यू शुड ऑलवेज वर्क विद इन मैनेज प्राइवेट वर्क स्पेसिस यू शुड एक्टिवली मैनेज दम इंश्योर दैट वंस सॉफ्टवेयर इज रेडी एंड इट इज मेट ऑल द नेसेसरी कंडीशंस फॉर इंक्लूजन इन टू द कन्फिग्रेशन कंट्रोल सिस्टम इट शुड बी uh submitted to the con- configuration control system uh immediately after that uh and uh, and a new workspace may be needed to uh to work on further development of that module but that depends on the uh on the need but it is very important uh that professionals the programmers should maintain their private workspaces which they manage for a particular project the next practice that we are going to talk about is says that uh, we need to save artifacts at the completion of intermediate steps of a larger change that is if we have change package that is a large number of change requests have been approved uh we need to submit the intermediate changes uh to the configuration control system you know, on a regular basis that's a good practice it enables uh, protection uh, against uh, accidental loss of um, software code uh, and reduces and actually eliminates lot of uh, uh, rework and uh, a lot of uh, problems that can happen that can come to life if such care is not uh, taken the next practice we are going to talk about is to regularly synchronize the development work with others it is very common that most of us uh, when we are working on software projects have to collaborate our uh, efforts to make a software uh, product and many individuals are working on even one subsystem or Uh, even one uh, small set of classes or objects or artifacts that uh, collaborate with each other that interface with each other and so uh, in order for us to uh, maintain sanity and maintain uh, understanding and visibility and traceability of um, different uh, elements in those software uh, on the pieces of software code uh, and to keep them in sync we need to uh, we need to synchronize different um, software codes we need to synchronize works of different uh, programmers and developers on a regular basis the sixth practice is that we need to define policies of branches code lines and workspaces that is what are the conditions that necessitate a creation of a branch how many code lines should we have and what are the rules and uh, for maintaining workspaces so let's discuss this particular practice in a little bit more detail let's first talk about code lines we need to identify how many development code lines are available and name each one of them in a given project typically there is only one code line but if you have a very large system and if you have system broken down into subsystems and there is need to maintain multiple code lines then that need will necessitate to do so uh, and so there is no one single mathematical formula that can guide us but if we have multiple code lines we should um, identify each one of them and give each one of them a unique name the second practice related to code lines is that we need to identify 
how often the development code lines must be integrated if we have more than one that is. Third is we need to identify who can make changes to a code line and under what circumstances. So we need to be very specific exactly as to what, uh, who is authorized to, to make changes and what are the conditions that would necessitate that. And fourth uh, is that we need to identify if parallel or non-parallel development is permitted for each code line. Can these two code lines uh, de be developed in, in parallel or they can only be developed in, in not, not parallel, that is only one of them can be developed at one time. Let's now talk a little bit about branches. We need to identify the necessary conditions for creating a branch. A branch is created from a baseline when we want to either explore something or to create a new version for a, for a customer. A baseline is uh, at, the, at the where the, the software artifact is stable, is submitted to the configuration control uh, management system and we, we create a branch from the, from the baseline. The second aspect regarding branches is that we need to identify the necessary conditions for merging a branch back into the source code line. So if we create a branch, then we obviously have to either, our experiment has been successful and we merge that branch back into the main um, code line, or we uh, sort of um, uh, go back and uh, destroy that branch if our experiment was not successful and we go back to our original code line. Uh, the third practice related to branches is that we need to identify the maximum period that an art artifact can undergo change without being saved into the configuration management system. That This means that you have created a branch and uh, we need to identify the allowed time for that, for the source code in that branch to be, without, to be out of the configuration control system and into the hands of developer without any checks. Uh, and if such a time lapses, then we need to uh, to raise an alarm. And this can be done with the help of tools without much difficulty. Let us now talk about uh, workspaces. We need to identify who can read and write artifacts of a workspace. If I am the owner of the workspace, then obviously I have that uh, that those rights. But do others have rights to access my workspace? or not is, is something that needs to be decided. And uh, there's another important aspect of workspace management is that we need to identify who can add artifacts to a workspace or delete them from the workspace. So if we have a workspace, can others uh, add files to it or add source code or other sort, sort of documents to it? or do they have, and do they have the authority to delete them? Some of them only have permission to, to add files or add artifacts to a workspace or a project, uh, while only the administrator or people having administrator rights have, have uh, 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 privilege to, uh, to delete uh, artifacts from from our workspace. So we need to uh, codify that and document that and um, ensure that these practices are being followed uh, manually uh, as well as uh, have been implemented in the configuration control tools uh, that are being uh, used. Let us now talk about practices for controlling changes to software artifacts. We have already looked at the generic change control process that can be obviously altered by an organization to meet their specific needs. But let's now talk about practices for controlling changes to software artifacts. 
The first is that we need to document identified software defects. This documentation is important as we have seen when we were talking about software defects earlier in this course uh, that we can document defects by severity level and develop a taxonomy. This helps us in combining our uh, change requests uh, to uh, remove or repair these defects. Changes are typically requested most often because defects have been identified, whether they are requirements defects or design defects or, or coding defects. And so if we document all the defects and develop a taxonomy uh, and reporting mechanism, then a lot of these uh, change requests can contain multiple defect uh, removal requests uh, for, from the software uh, artifacts. And so this way we can uh, minimize the change requests that are sent uh, to the con configuration control board. Uh, the second uh, is that we need to create a defined process for requesting and approving changes. We had talked about generic process of change control in the last lecture and it was a comprehensive discussion so we will not be able to repeat that discussion here but to summarize that uh, that discussion uh, we had we have two points in uh, in that process that needs highlighting again number one is that we need to create and use change control board or change control authority and secondly, we need to use change packages. These are aggregate collection of related changes to reduce the uh, execution of change control process. Uh, if we do, don't aggregate these um, change requests in, let's say, change packages or in one change request, the lot of uh, things, lot of processes, lot of activities within the change control process will be repeated multiple times and so we need to be careful about making requests to uh, requests for changes uh, many times instead we should develop a change request package that can contain uh, multiple change requests uh, especially related to change requests uh, defects uh, that have been identified together or are related should be combined in those uh, change packages. The third practice is that we need to apply defect repairs to existing releases and ongoing development effort. Let's say that a request for repair has been made which means that a defect has been identified and that defect needs to be removed and software has already been um, released to the customer or at least one version of that has been released to the customer. Uh, on approval from the change control board, changes will be made to the development uh, release obviously, but if uh, if a release is not expected very soon, a new release is not expected very soon, then all those customers who are using that software project need to uh, be given the uh, updated software or uh, typically, especially in case of um, security, we call these patches. These patches need to be provided to the existing customers so they can also get rid of the defects that are known uh, in their software products. Let us now talk a little bit about practices for building software systems. For every software product, every software release, uh, the 
entire software product consists of uh, several, or in many cases, many cases hundreds of individual software components or individual software modules or individual software programs that need to be uh, built together, integrated together uh, to create uh, a, a larger software system. So the practices that we should have, we should adopt, is number one, to use shared and static build processes and tools. That is, every time we uh, build a system or integrate a system into a project, uh, it should result in the same project. It, this should be a static process. There should, no, there should be no surprises in it, and we should preferably use uh, tools uh, that will automate the process of uh, building software products. The second practice in this area is that we need to build software on a regular basis, preferably on a daily basis, that by the end of the day, we would have a build available uh, that incorporates all the work that has been done uh, in one day and all the prior work. So, uh, and if not on a daily basis, then at least once a week uh, that build should be created. But uh, if you leave it on a weekly basis, uh, there, there are possibilities that the uh, integration problems would result uh, and a lot of time would be uh, wasted uh, because a week's worth of work and prior work has to be uh, has to be built together, and there can be many problems or, or, or problems which are created as a result of the snowball effect that a minor problem can create uh, a, a set of uh, problems or ripple effect of problems will be faced. So it is advisable to uh, build systems um, on, on a daily basis, but at least after, uh, you know, if that's not possible, then at least every other day a build should be created. Let's now talk about practices for releasing software systems. These include maintaining a unique read-only copy of each release for each customer. Now, if we are using uh, software tools to uh, develop a release, uh, then this can be easily done. The customer is given a copy of the product and a copy is maintained by the development team or by the vendor to keep a record and no changes should be made in that build. This is a read-only copy of each of that software release. Uh, this will keep the development team and the customer in sync with what has been given to, uh, to a, a customer at any given time uh, on a specific uh, release. And so the customer will, will, uh, will be assured that the development team also has the same version and no changes have been made to, to that version uh, in case there are uh, concerns or queries regarding that, that version. The second practice is, is that a version manifest should describe each software release. So that version manifest should be given to uh, the customer as well as a copy should be maintained uh, by the development team uh, which has information about all the uh, components, all the software programs, all the modules um, that are part of that 
release. And so it should, the, man, the, the version manifest should um, have, the det have detailed information about what is the version number of each uh, program. Uh, and uh, this manifest can also help us in recreating um, or referring to exact um, uh, source code elements or source code artifacts uh, in, a, in a given uh, software release. The third practice is that the software artifacts that comprise a release should adhere to defined acceptance criteria. In other words, every software source code artifact that's included in a release meets the acceptance criteria uh, set upon or agreed upon between agreed upon by the uh, customer as well as the developer and so this will work as a uh, software quality assurance mechanism that every component that is given to the customer meets the acceptance criteria both technical as well as manage, manage, managerial uh, or process related uh, that, uh, uh, that have been agreed to by the customer as well as the developer. So this gives a lot of confidence to the customer that everything that they have been given meets the acceptance criteria which has been agreed to by the both parties. Let us now talk about practices for maintaining integrity of software artifacts. It is very important to maintain uh, integrity of software artifacts and the entire configuration management system uh, is one of the purposes is of software configuration management system is to maintain integrity of software artifacts. So the first practice is that we need to use a software tool to perform software configuration management functions. As I would said before that uh, software configuration management functions can not be truly performed without the help of a good uh, software tool uh, that Ha, that meant that can be tailored to uh, fulfill the policies set by an organization that meets or can enable the uh, following of practices and procedures. And so a number of tools are available. It is uh, on all sorts of platforms, on Microsoft-based platforms, tools are available on open source uh, products are also available and so any organization, any development team, I would say as a uh, smaller team as two people should use uh, software configuration management tools to coordinate to improve their uh, software development activity. Um, we will not be able to discuss different tools uh, in this in this course, but it is very important that all of us learn at least one tool and use it effectively to maintain our different versions and all the aspects of software configuration management. The second practice is that repositories should exist on reliable physical storage elements. The technology has advanced and is continuously advancing in this area. There are a number of technologies available uh, which are very reliable uh, for storage purposes and um, uh, the data can be duplicated automatically using these technologies. So uh, instead of um, um, having cheap and unreliable storage for configuration management library uh, repositories, 
we should utilize reliable uh, storage medium for storing repositories of configuration management system. Configuration management repositories should undergo periodic backups that will enable us to keep backup of uh, software that uh, has been created uh, with a lot of hard work from uh, all uh, personnel. Uh, and uh, the fourth practice is that we should test and confirm the backup process from these uh, repositories. Typically, in organizations, backups are taken, but if there is, a, there is no mishap, there is no need, uh, these backups are not restored, and uh, the data, restored data is not used. Uh, and it is hoped that the, uh, whenever the need arises, these uh, res restores will take us back to wherever we want to uh, go, but this needs to be verified. Uh, and so it is the responsibility of the concerned people to, or the software configuration management staff to ensure that um, the restore process has been um, tested uh, and, and, and verified. Let us now talk about a procedure uh, or discuss a procedure for creating configuration management systems. The first step in that is that we need to acquire highly reliable and redundant physical storage and processing elements for the software repository. As I was saying that the technology exists uh, which is highly reliable and redundant so that the data is copied on multiple storage elements. The second step of a procedure would be to identify configuration management administrator who is responsible for different tasks the key tasks include uh, creation of configuration management accounts and assignment of capabilities to them, that is creating responsibilities within that computing system. And the second task is the enforcement of defined configuration management policies and procedures have to be defined before tool is acquired or at least have to be defined before a tool is used. And the third is the building of internal and external deliveries. The third step in creating a configuration management system is that we need to define a backup procedure to regularly backup configuration management repositories to non-volatile storage and periodically purge them of redundant or useless data, data that we don't need. This procedure should identify when incremental and full backups are done. For example, on a daily basis, you don't need to do full backups. You can do incremental backups, but on a weekly basis, you can conduct a full backup of configuration management system. The next step is that you need to define a procedure that verifies that a backup process functions correctly and we had just talked about this a few minutes ago. The next step is to determine whether work must be authorized. If work is authorized then we need to establish a change control board, assign people to the change control board and define rules for approving changes to artifacts. This is based on a change request. If a change request is submitted, should we approve it or not? If we approve it, then that has to be done using a change control board. The next step is that we need to identify the number of development lines. Typically, one is sufficient. If more than one development line or code line, as we have referred to, is needed, then we need to specify the frequency 
of the integration of each development line into the main development line or main code line. Another step is that we need to identify the number of new tasks that an individual can work on simultaneously. That is how programmers are given assignments and tasks that they can perform simultaneously. We also need to determine whether parallel development is permitted, determine if branches can be created for tasks other than parallel development or the development of releases. If branches can be created, then we need to identify who can create a branch, specify under what conditions these branches can be created, and establish the criteria for determining when merges are performed. And so this process of merging is very important because uh, it does, at this time, uh, two different uh, versions of the same code is to be uh, brought together and merged with each other. And uh, if there are any conflicts, those need to be resolved. The next step in the procedure is that we need to determine who can create workspaces, specify standard workspaces. There are certain individual workspaces, but there are also standard workspaces in a project. Another important step is to identify what information should be specified with each new development task, with each new change request, and if a defect report is submitted. So you need to consider performing following steps that we are going to talk about now, following actions for each change request and anomaly report or defect report as it is known. The first is that we need to estimate the size of the change. Second is to identify any alternative solutions. Third is to identify the complexity of the change and the impact on other systems. Next would be to identify when the need exists, identify the effect of the change will have on subsequent work, estimate the cost of the change, identify the criticality of the change request, and identify if another change request will solve this problem. And we also need to identify the effort to verify the change. So this is the procedure that is part of the configuration management system. We will also need to identify who will verify the change, identify whether the right people are available to work on the request, to implement the request that is, identify the impact on critical system resources if that is an issue if resources are scarce, we need to identify the length of time that the change request has been pending. That is, it may be for weeks that this request has been made, but no action has been taken. So that should also should be taken into consideration while developing a procedure. The, another important step in this procedure is the selection of metrics data to be gathered and the metrics that can be gathered are, for example, number of change requests that have been submitted, the number of change requests reviewed and approved for resolution. The third measurement data that can be gathered is the number of change requests resolved and the length of resolution, that is amount of time it took to resolve an issue. And the next metric that can be collected is the number of defect report or number of anomaly reports. Then there is number of anomaly reports reviewed and approved for correction. So first is how many defect reports came in and second is that how many of them were reviewed and approved for correction. Third related metric is the number of defect reports or anomaly reports corrected and the amount of time it took for correction. The next metric that can be collected is the number of 
artifacts changed with each change request and finally the number of artifacts changed more than once. These should be characterized by the number of changes and frequency of changes that are related to one software artifact. And that can also indicate if there are errors in a specific software artifact. Another important step in this procedure is that we need to acquire a configuration management tool that is able to manage software configurations, document identified software defects, and produce software releases. These are the practices that we have already talked about. Now we are putting them together in a procedure that can be used for creating a configuration management system. And we need to automate policies, practices, and procedures as much as possible. So this concludes our discussion on a procedure that can be used for creating a configuration management system. We do not have to, we must, we are allowed to uh, tailor this procedure depending on the configuration management system that we are developing. Um, but these are the broad categories, ingredients, so to speak, of uh, different important things that must be followed when you need to create a configuration management system. Let us now talk a little bit about uh, best change control practices from software industries perspectives. We had looked at this industry-wide uh, quality uh, aspects in the beginning of this course. So if we, if we repeat that uh, uh, process here with respect to configuration management practices, uh, it will refresh, that, refresh us that software industry is split into multiple areas. There are MIS software projects, there are outsourced software projects, there are system software projects, there are commercial software projects, and then there are military software projects, and each one of them, or each category of these projects, would require a slightly different uh, configuration management uh, practices, uh, and uh, one set of practices cannot be applied directly to um, the other set of um, uh, practices or cannot be directly applied to every domain that software systems address. So let us now first talk about change control practices for MIS software projects. The first is that we need to have change control boards for all projects larger than 5,000 function points. And at CCB, usually would have a minimum of three people and a maximum of seven people. There should be an automated change control process for all deliverables, which include requirements, specifications, design documents, source code, test plans, user documentation, and training material. For projects larger than 15, function points in size, estimate and measure the function point totals of all changes to software projects. So whenever there is there are changes, we need to have measurements and uh, estimation and measurements of function points if the number of function points uh, 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 is, is more than 15. These changes include requirements, creep, removal or deferral of feature uh, and requirements sharing. So function point metrics for change must be, uh, must be determined and recorded 
uh, for MIS projects. For outsourced software projects, large outsourced vendors are quite uh, often experts in implementing change control mechanisms because they have the expertise in certain areas and they can use their configuration uh, control repo repositories to create different versions and different releases of related software projects. For outsourced software projects, often an application, after it has been deployed, uh, new functions and modifications are requested on an average of 7% for several years in the beginning. Another practice for change control related to outsourced software project is change estimation and costing in contracts. Uh, specific clauses for change control are included in uh, outsourced agreements. The forms of clauses vary with the specific needs of the client but are often based on predicted volumes of the changes. Initial sets of requirements have a fixed price, but new requirements will be included at a higher price. So this is also a mechanism for change control. Another practice is that function point metrics for changes are calculated uh, or are estimated and measured. So we need to estimate and measure the function point totals of all changes to software projects larger than 15 function points and for outsourced uh, software project change control board should be constituted for all projects larger than 5000 function points and CCB usually has three to seven members. Automated change control should be incorporated for all uh, deliverables which include requirements, specifications, design documents, source code, test plans user documentation and training material, automated change controls, tools that support only source code are adequate for projects larger than 100 function points. Let's talk about system software projects. For these kinds of project changes during development can occur for a much wider uh, variety of reasons uh, than those found in internal information systems. For system software projects, all projects which has function points 10,000 or more should have CCBs and uh, automated change control should be applied as much as possible. We should determine the uh, function point metrics for all changes uh, and this data can be used for chargebacks and for billing and to ascertain the monthly rate of requirements uh, creep. Let's now talk about commercial software projects. Commercial software vendors may market the same application on different hardware platforms. So they offer same application in different languages also. That is natural languages. They can offer a version in, in English. They can offer the same software uh, with the German interface or with the French interface. And so when major changes occur, they affect dozens of versions of a software product. And so change control is a key technology for commercial software vendors. And one of the most important and very well practiced activity is automated change control for commercial software projects. Let's talk about military software. Military software community was an early adopter of change control practices. Change control starts during initial development and continues until an application is retired. Change control boards are created for all projects which has more than 10,000 function points and, and consists of many representations representative from customer and from all uh, departments within the uh, system engineering project. Automated change control is applied uh, to as many projects uh, as possible. Uh, function point metrics are calculated, determined for changes. Cost estimates are made for changes so that an accurate uh, accounting uh, can be done. 
requirements tracing and changes are collaborated are noted down the relationship between changes and tracing them to uh, to requirements uh, is an important uh, aspect of military software uh, projects uh, and so if you look at a broad set of projects from that that are performed uh, by the software industry all of them have their unique practices we have also talked about best practices for a generic set of best practices for uh, software configuration today we have looked at a procedure that can be customized that can be tailored to meet specific uh, needs of a project uh, in implementing and creating a software configuration management uh, but one thing is um, very important and that is that we need to have we need to follow these best practices for maintaining software configuration management thank you very much